So based on all the experiments Mendel uh, developed and did, he came up with some laws and some theories. We're going to look at some of those right here. Again, studying just a simple garden pea in his monastery in Austria. So again, he's the uh, first one to come up with the idea of heredity and considered the father of modern genetics. And he worked with garden peas in his monastery in Austria. One of the first things he came up with, one of the first theories he came up with, is the fundamental theory of heredity. Parents do not transmit traits directly to their offspring. They do so via factors called genes. And this is what we're tracking in our Punnett squares. Remember, our genes are a segment of DNA that encodes for a very specific amino acid sequence or a specific protein. How genes influence traits? Well, this should look familiar, the central dogma here, going from our DNA to our RNA to our proteins. The amino acid sequence determines the shape and activity of the proteins. Proteins determine in large measure what the body looks like and how it functions, potentially its color um, and basically its structure. Mutations in a gene result in alleles, and this ultimately leads to a change in the amino acid sequence and also the activity of the protein. Natural selection may favor one allele over another. So it's important to remember a mutation does not necessarily automatically mean a bad thing. A mutation simply means that there's been a change in the gene. Whether it's a good change or a bad change will result from the environment or the natural selection that occurs. So if it's advantageous um, to have blue eyes or brown eyes, uh, that's going to be selected by the environment. Um, other mutations will be, again, determined whether or not they're beneficial based on the environment that they're in. If you have webbing on your hands, uh, you're going through and doing a lot of quick typing that may not be advantageous, but if you're a duck swimming in the water and you lose the webbing, that would not be a good thing. So again, it depends on the environment. Other law, law of segregation. During reproduction, the alleles that determine traits are separated into reproductive cells by a process called meiosis and randomly unite during fertilization. The two alleles of a gene separate when forming gametes, and the gametes combine randomly to form an offspring. So this is our segregation here. See, our randomly segregated or randomly placed into different cells that will then merge together with an egg and a sperm or egg and a pollen grain uh, when you're forming the actual zygote. And this segregation is just that separating out or segregating where those alleles go. This is how it may look. Again, this is the male, this is the female forming our seeds. So we have our pollen grain here and our egg merging together form seed A, or in this case, seed B if you have different segregation that's occurring. How this may look and looking at color, if it was as simple as being simply orange or green, if you took a pure orange and it was capital O, capital O, and a pure green, two lowercase g's, you bred these together, ideally, you'd have all orange offspring. But all these would be heterozygous because they would all have the green gene also there. If we were to breed these together, you'd get a Punnett square that looks like this, and 25% would be green. The other 75% though would be orange. And again, phenotypically speaking, genotypically speaking, only one would be double dominant um, orange. The other two would be heterozygous. Another law of, was in the law of independent assortment. So here, genes located on different chromosomes will be inherited independently from one another. That means if you have a gene on chromosome one, chromosome nine, they're going to be in inherited independently of one another. This is their independent assortment. All the genes located in chromosome one will be moved over, and chromosome nine will be moved separately. This is independent assortment, assorting things in, in basically an independent, in often a random way. This is how it looks, independent assortment and segregation, as we're forming our dihybrid cross here. And remember, this is the symbol for female and male. And you can see our segregation image and our independent assortment image here. Something else that adds to genetic variability is crossing over. And we looked at this uh, during meiosis one. Homologous chromosomes basically come into contact with one another, and a little part of one can, re can combine with another part of another, meaning one can break off and transfer over. Uh, it, it's an exchange in the positions of the chromosomes. Genetic information is exchanged between homologous chromosomes. Remember, they're basically getting lined up, and you have one kind of flipping positions with the other, and that's what this shows right here. The two recombinant chromosomes are then formed, so this adds to the genetic variability of an offspring. Now, random fertilization occurs. A single egg fertilized by a single sperm. It's important to remember you're a very unique individual. Considering independent sperm and random fertilization, 
and offspring represents one out of 72 trillion, yes, that's trillion zygote possibilities. There's about eight and a half million different ways uh, to make individual different sperm and 85 million different ways to make an egg. So 8.5 million times the 8.5 million, excuse me, 8.5 million times 8.5 million will give you 72 trillion zygote possibilities. So you may ask initially the question, what about identical twins? Well, after fertilization, after the zygote's made, if that zygote then is to divide after the fact, then you'd have two identical um, twins. This is the odds, 1 in 72 trillion, that a genetically identical sperm will meet identically identical eggs. So you're very unique. Here's a multiple traits. We're going to look at this when we do dihybrid crosses here. Remember, we're not just like a pea plant. We're not inheriting white or purple flowers. We might be inheriting things together, and that's the point of this dihybrid cross, which we'll go over. First, a little vocabulary here. Uh, each parent contains two copies of a factor governing each trait. If the two copies are the same, they're called homozygous, as we see here. Capital B, capital B. This is homozygous. If two copies are different, they would be called heterozygous. In this case, it would be heterozygous. A big B and a little b. Little b and a big b. Here, two little b's is also homozygous. This would be homozygous recessive. This would be homozygous dominant. Our alleles are forms or factors that lead to different traits. Ultimate forms are called alleles. So here we inherit one from parent one and parent two. In this case, allele for both tall genes. Here from parent one, it's getting a wrinkled uh, pea pod. Uh, and here it's getting a smooth, again, different alleles. Depending which one's dominant or recessive, we'll determine which one is expressed. It gives you the alleles being transmitted through an inbred pedigree, again, that family tree. We can trace things through this. That's why it's important to be able to understand these and recognize some of these. This is a very basic one. Phenotype and genotype you've already mentioned. Phenotype is how an individual may look. Genotype is the actual genetics. So here's our genotypes represented here by our capital and lowercase w's and our phenotypes. Normal wings and in this case wrinkled wings is our phenotype. Notice the wrinkled wings is a homozygous recessive genotype and the dominant is for normal wings. Again, those dominant recessive alleles, the two alleles an individual possesses, do not affect one another. Uh, again, a dominant versus recessive. Dominant is going to be expressed. And recessive will only be expressed in the homozygous recessive state. Dominant alleles are represented by uppercase letters. Recessive by lowercase letters. It is dominant alleles express the phenotype when at least one of those alleles is present. That can be the heterozygous or the homozygous. Here. The recessive is only expressed expressed as a phenotype when both copies, both from both parents, are represented. In this case, two little r's. Therefore, the p would be wrinkled because it's a recessive trait versus the round trait. We don't know if this one is homozygous dominant or heterozygous. We do know there's at least one allele, though, that is in the dominant or round um, genes. Our homologous chromosomes, they're the same size, the same shape. They carry genes with the same traits, but they're not necessarily identical. In this case here, there's a heterozygous here. Different genes might be located. Okay, this would be one from dad, one from mom. That's why we're two N organisms um, diploid. And in this case, we have a lot of homozygous dominance. So this would be the same. But in this case, they're not identical, these chromosomes. One allele from mom, one allele from dad. Each trait is determined by inheritance of those two alleles. The alleles present in the chromosome are distributed to gametes during meiosis. This is why we have so many different possibilities, because there's so many different genes that can be combination in many different ways. Dominant recessive inheritance, again, there's something called carriers I want to draw your attention to. In our Punnett squares here, a carrier would be represented by heterozygous. So this would be a carrier here, meaning it's not, recessive genes not going to be expressed, it's carried, it's present there, and it may show up in the offspring, but it will not show up in that particular individual. Uh, some traits occur in a range uh, as a possibility. I don't want to think this is always clear, cut, and dry. With pea plants, though, it is pretty clear, cut, and dry. Eye color for one in particular is one that varies a lot. So in the case of how can two people with brown eyes have someone with blue eyes, gets into a little bit of the complexities of genetics here. Uh, the odds are definitely for brown eyes, uh, but because it's a dominant, there's um, many different traits that can occur, many different genotypes that can represent that same phenotype those different genotypes can result in different offspring. 
However, if you have two people with blue eyes, because that's a recessive trait, the odds are very much in the favor of the offspring to also have blue eyes. Recessive traits, again, that carrier aspect, the presence of an allele does not ensure the trait will be expressed in individual, in individual as an example of recessive trait. So here we have two carriers. Yes, they can produce 25% of their offspring being homozygous dominant, but 25% will be homozygous recessive. The other 50% will be carriers of that particular trait, not expressing it, carrying that recessive allele. Again, recessive does not necessarily mean bad. Autosomal dominant is one possible way for a trait or a disorder in some cases to be inherited. As we see here, uh, in autosomal dominant disease, if the abnormal gene is inherited only from one parent, the disease will be present. So in this case, if it's a dominant um, di disorder or disease, it's going to be expressed even if only one allele is there. The um, recessive, though, means an organism needs two copies of that gene in order to express that. If only one copy is present, um, expression will not occur. That person will be considered a carrier. And that person being a carrier will not be infected themselves, but can still pass that on to their offspring. And then if an offspring of an autosomal recessive, um, basically combination of alleles, typically the parents are carriers. So if the offspring represents it, but the parents do not, the parents are likely to be carriers. Hopefully this is helpful in explaining a little bit about heredity and genetics.